This course is called the School of Hard Knocks, the most up-to-date information on TBI, CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, and the NFL concussion crisis. My name is Andy Morgenstern. I'm an optometrist in Bethesda, Maryland, and I work at the Walter Reed National Military Medical Center uh, in Bethesda, Maryland as a contractor at the Vision Center of Excellence. A uh, couple of relevant relationships besides my work at Walter Reed. I'm also a member of the Boston University Dean's Advisory Board and I'm a recipient of their Distinguished Alumni Award at Boston University. And I'll tell you in this lecture why that has some relevance. All the information in this presentation is my opinion only. It's all based on peer-reviewed information and was gained through the public domain. I have no financial interest regarding anything discussed in this presentation. And my current assignment, like I said, is a contractor at the Vision Center of Excellence at Walter Reed. All the information presented is my opinion only. It's not the opinion of the U.S. Government, Department of Defense, Department of Veterans Affairs, Army, Navy, Air Force, Vision Center of Excellence, any other U.S. government organization. Uh, as a contractor with, uh, formerly with Booz Allen Hamilton and now Chenega Health Services, um, I am presenting on my behalf and not anybody else. I do have some disclosures some groups that I work with, and I'm uh, proud to work with them. I uh, uh, gain a lot of knowledge and a lot of information through them. Uh, we work together to develop uh, more uh, um, information knowledge for different companies. Here's some volunteer positions that I have uh, over the years, and if you have any questions, obviously, you can get in touch with me. So the first thing I just want to uh, go over here, sorry about that, um, information. You know, one of the things that I work with uh, is the evidence-based clinical practice guidelines for the American Optometric Association, and we are a research evidence-based organization. And I always like to say uh, this show this quote by Abraham Lincoln, don't believe everything you read on the internet just because there's a picture with a quote next to it. Um, obviously that's a lot of pun because Abraham Lincoln was not alive while the internet was around. Uh, however, uh, all the information I'm going to give you today is uh, of the highest quality uh, that, I, that I could obtain um, uh, with peer-reviewed evidence. So a couple of things that you need to know. Uh, the evidence-based guidelines, here's one, the comprehensive pediatric eye and vision examination. We also have one for uh, the adult examination, uh, the diabetes guideline. We're working on glaucoma right now. But we have some great evidence-based clinical practice guidelines through the American Optometric Association for all of us that are members out there uh, should access. And quite frankly, even if you're not a member, they're uh, publicly available. Most importantly, I think, as it relates to this presentation, um, there's something out there. If you don't know about it, you should be aware of it uh, from the American Optometric Association, and that is the Brain Injury Electronic Resource Manual. There's two versions, Part A and Part B, and it's a comprehensive resource to aid optometrists in evaluating patients with brain injury. So quite frankly, if you forget everything that I tell you uh, on this webinar today, uh, these, uh, a lot of this information actually is accessible in this Brain Injury Electronic Resource Manual um, that is available from the American Optometric Association. And so the Vision Center of Excellence, I work with them. Well, what is that? Well, the Vision Center of Excellence was uh, authorized by Congress in, in 2008 in the defense budget, which authorized us to uh, address the full scope of vision care, including prevention, diagnosis, mitigation, treatment, research, and the rehabilitation of military eye injuries and diseases, including vision dysfunctions related to traumatic brain injury. That's where a lot of my experience and um, uh, information that I've learned over the years come from. I've, I've been with the Vision Center of Excellence uh, since 2012, and we've done a lot of work together. Well, one of those documents that is publicly available also, so you guys can access this online, it's, uh, it was uh, finally revised in 2015, end of 2015, but this document here, it's a wonderful uh, uh, piece that can actually help you through working with uh, a patient with traumatic brain injury as you're doing an eye exam, and it's titled The Eye and Vision Care Following Blast Exposure uh, and or Possible Traumatic Brain Injury. And really, uh, you know, the brain doesn't know if it was hit in Afghanistan by an IED or if it was hit in a high school football game on a Sunday or a Friday. And uh, so a, a TBI is a TBI. And vision dysfunction is vision dysfunction, and this can actually help you along the way. <clears throat> this has obviously been pretty important in our profession. And, uh, you know, even in uh, uh, our journals that we have out there, this one is from the Review of Optometry uh, a bunch of years ago. 
um, talking about traumatic brain injury and the optometrist's role. And obviously, as we all know, the optometrist plays a critical role in traumatic brain injury, as there are many uh, th things that we can pick up on our eye exams that relate to vision dysfunction from the, from the actual brain injury. This one was, uh, article was uh, written by my uh, friend and colleague, Colonel Frank, uh, Francis McVeigh, who was the chief of Walter Reed Optometry for quite some time and is still working with the military. <coughs> but for those of us that do work at Walter Reed, uh, obviously we see uh, lots of TBIs and uh, lots of vision dysfunction associated with it as well. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, here's some objectives. We're going to talk about statistics on <coughs> MTBI, which is a um, minor, uh, mild TBI, also known as a concussion, diffuse axonal injury, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, re rehabilitative options, the impact of vision deficits on return to play and work, and obviously that relates to the uh, NFL and the NFL concussion protocol, and also some military uh, information on mild TBI and other moderate severe TBIs as well. Um, so let's talk about statistics and uh, TBI. You know, we have to remember that um, uh, we all know that vision takes up probably about 40 to 50 percent of our entire brain mass, and uh, knowing where the vision uh, pathways travel through the brain is critically important. So remembering your anatomy of the brain as an optometrist is also critically important and realizing that obviously all these parts of the brain um, do exist and uh, there are uh, pieces of anatomy that we have to be concerned with. So what's a TBI? TBI, if we break it down by the definition for the Centers for Disease Control, and this is important uh, uh, if you are taking a test at the end of this, I would remember this slide, <clears throat> and this probably this first sentence, a TBI is caused by a bump, blow, or jolt to the head or a penetrating head injury that disrupts the normal function of the brain. Not all blows or jolts to the head result in a TBI, and the severity can range from mild to severe. Uh, it can go from unconscious to conscious. There could be memory loss. Uh, and most TBIs that occur each year are mild and commonly called concussions. And when we grade TBIs, as you can see on the chart in front of you, typically we grade them in three categories, mild, moderate, and severe. And... <clears throat> excuse me, pardon me, you can see here that we uh, uh, grade them uh, on primary damage or injury or mechanism, loss of consciousness or alteration of consciousness at level of amnesia, uh, the Glasgow Coma Scale, uh, how the imaging was, was there bleeding, was there not bleeding, were there comorbidities, comorbidities uh, with the actual injury, and, and really what the outcome was. So let's go over some terms and types. We're going to talk about concussion, which is also known as a mild TBI, uh, something called diffuse axonal injury, and also something called chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So in addition to a mild TBI, there's other kinds of brain injuries that can occur. And, you know, people don't necessarily think the list is that long. They just categorize it typically into, uh, you know, concussions or traumatic brain injuries. But all of these other things that you see on the list in front of you can also be categorized as a traumatic brain injury, and it could be obviously you know traumatic uh, or acquired. And some, typically, some people don't necessarily think as uh, brain bleeds and subarachnoid hemorrhages just some one of the things on the list over here as uh, TBIs, but but they are. So concussion is another name for a mild traumatic brain injury. It's the most common form of TBI. We talked about that. That is probably a question on your tests. The effects are usually temporary, but can include headaches and problems with concentration, memory balance, coordination, and these can easily and commonly affect vision, <coughs> as opposed to a diffuse axonal injury. This one's a lot more uh, um, problematic because it occurs in about half of all severe head traumas. Um, typically, they can, uh, they can also occur in moderate and mild brain injuries. Uh, they're typically diffuse and not focal. Uh, that is another question on your test if you're paying attention. Diffuse axonal injury obviously are diffuse and not focal. And the severe diffuse axonal injury is one of the leading causes of death in people with traumatic brain injury. And unfortunately, a lot of these we can't really see on neuroimaging. <coughs> diffuse axonal injury really, uh, the most common place for it to happen is right at that white matter, gray matter junction. And it's typically classified as a junctional injury since that is a potential weak spot after getting 
uh, you know, hit in the head. It results from the brain moving back and forth inside the skull as a result of acceleration and deceleration, also known as a coup contra coup type injury. And what happens is that it's a it's a shearing injury, and it's as the tissue after the jolt bump or blow happens. Um, the tissue slides over other tissue on top of it as that brain is moving around at awkward angles. And this is what's really responsible for unconsciousness as well as some of the vegetative states that occur after a severe head injury. So you can see over here, this is a pretty uh, commonly, you know, this is, a, this is a nerve cell. So we have the cell body on the left over here, the axon. The axon's covered uh, in a sheath. Um, that myelin sheath, and that, uh, you know, ends over at terminal branches of the axon where it communicates with the next cell over. And, you know, this whole uh, system carries a, a neural impulse. And unfortunately, what happens in diffuse axonal injury, oh, just to give you an idea of how big we're talking about here, um, if the big blue circle is the diameter of one human hair, an axon is the size of that little green dot down to the right of it. So we're talking about some very fragile wiring. It's very skinny, it's very small, very thin, and it's about a hundred times smaller than a human hair. <coughs> so as we were talking about, you can see the white matter, gray matter uh, junction. So when this injury happens, as you can see depicted in the image, um, and you can see skull tissue, the dura mater as well. Um, what happens is as that brain starts to rotate, you have this tearing or sheathing action taking place right at that junctional area uh, where the axon really kind of tears, rotates, and shears off. And you might have pulling and stretching, you might have tearing, or you might have a complete sheathing. It can happen any one, but the end result here is, is uh, damage to that axon and uh, ultimately cell death. And as uh, we have more and more cell death, we obviously have different problems like loss of consciousness, uh, vegetative states, and a lot of other issues. So here you can see on the left the normal axon. You can see the twisting, shearing action, uh, action of the axon itself with the myelin sheath. And the post-trauma condition is permanent cell death uh, of the brain cell. Now, I said before we typically couldn't do that much neuroimaging with these, but uh, quite frankly, in the in the recent in the recent past, there is a new uh, type of susceptibility weighted imaging MRI sequence that's sensitive to compounds which distort the magnetic field, and we can detect some blood products and calcium that takes place in some of these patients. Not all; it's not definitive, uh, but it's on its way to learning um, and detecting some of these subtle findings that we see in diffuse axonal injury. And as you can see over here. In this image, um, we can start to see with the naked eye, obviously, some uh, damage in that brain slice um, on the bottom right. But we can all start to see some uh, highlight injuries on this susceptibility weighted imaging on this screen over here, these big black spots. Um, <clears throat> it's probably the best MRI technique to find the, the, the uh, uh, hemo, hemosiderin staining uh, and other injuries that are associated with uh, diffuse axonal injury. So diffuse axonal injury uh, is, is definitively an axon injury um, where you have cell death. And that is different from CTE or uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is what you've probably heard in the news a lot uh, regarding the NFL and really what led to the entire NFL concussion crisis, among other professional sports and, and um college sports and high school sports and <clears throat> all the way down to elementary school sports. Uh, but this is the stuff. And so I want to talk about the difference between the two, between diffuse axonal injury and chronic traumatic encephalopathy, because they're two, definitive, two definitively different diseases, um, both of which cause brain injury and both of which can cause vision dysfunction, but their mechanism of action is is different. So I told you before during my disclosures that I was affiliated with Boston University and my history goes back. Um, I went to undergrad school at Boston University. I got my Bachelor of Science there and back at that time, it was a long time ago, um, it was, uh, uh, they did not have the Boston University Center for the Study of Traumatic Encephalopathy because we didn't know about it until 
um, uh, the early 2000s, uh, and I graduated from, from Boston University in 1983. So, um, lo and behold, I stay in touch with my alma mater, and over time, uh, learn what's going on, and I uh, stay involved and affiliated with them. And uh, I still, to this day, on one of their dean's advisory boards, <clears throat> parallel to all this stuff that I'm doing, uh, something else is happening at the same time, which is this department was uh, really being created. And the more.